Good day. So good to be here with you again. Week after week, it seems. And uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. Thank you for inviting me uh, into your places, your homes, your cars, wherever you are. And uh, for having an opportunity together to look at the Word of God and to, um, and to understand what the message might be for us today. And hopefully uh, walk away from this with... Uh, a good, solid hope in our Lord Christ. I want us to consider as we begin uh, John's Gospel, chapter 18, and there we find the, uh, the story, the events around the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. Jesus was betrayed by his disciple Judas and was arrested, and the text reminds us in the very first verse of, Ch of John, chapter 18, that it was across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples had entered. And from the garden scene, Jesus was taken to Annas, the father in the law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time. Jesus was questioned and then sent to Caiaphas, who in turn, along with the Sanhedrin, presented Jesus, pardon me, to the governor of the Roman province of Judea, Pontus Pilate. And after the charges were brought before Pilate, Pilate uh, spoke privately with Jesus. And we have that conversation recorded for us in John chapter 18, verse 33 to 38. If you want to flip there, you can. Here we see that the accusation that Pilate needed to reconcile was the question of who Jesus was. Now Jesus answered, so Pilate asked, pardon me, so <laughs> back up a bit. Pilate then asked Jesus if, if he was the king of the Jews. And Jesus uh, did not answer that directly. But he did say that his kingdom was not of this world. But if it was of this world, Jesus went on to say that his servants would take up the fight to have him released. And Pilate asked Jesus again, so are you the king? You are a king. Jesus again said, you say I am. But the reason he said he was born and had come to the world was what? To bear witness to the truth. And that anyone who is of the truth listens, listens to Jesus' voice. And Pilate, in turn, said to Jesus, what is truth? You find that uh, in John 18, verse 37 and 38. So we can only really speculate, my friends, why Pilate said what he said in response to Jesus, what is truth? Yet as we consider our postmodern world that denies that truth can be known, the question, what is truth, is an important question to address. Again, unfortunately, because of uh, the format that we're in, we're not able to give this question our full effort and time. But something can be said to at least highlight its importance, and especially as we consider the biblical text for today. And I want to start by stating ever so briefly uh, what truth is not. And I want to give credit where credit's due. So the ideas here that are going, I'm going to present to you uh, are from gotquestions.org. As we consider our culture, we would say it is a feel-good culture. But friends, truth is not what makes people feel good. Because bad news is also true, and bad news usually doesn't feel good. Moving along, truth is not simply what is believed, because you can believe a lie, and it's still a lie. Truth is not what the majority believe. For example, if 51% of a group reaches a decision, it can be a wrong decision. Now, there's so many ways we could put this, but I'll just give you one more for the road. Truth is not how we know. Truth is what we know. As we consider then from the, another angle, the philosophical viewpoint, we can speak of truth in three ways. One, truth is that which corresponds to reality. Two, truth is that which matches its object. And finally, three, truth is simply telling it like it is. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we cannot explore this further. I uh, wish we could in our brief time today, but suffice, suffice it to ask another question. Why is truth important? Why is it important for you and me to understand and accept that absolute truth exists and operates in all areas of our lives. 
Why? Because, friends, life has consequences, especially for being wrong. Take, for example, this idea. If you take incorrect medications or you take the wrong amount of medications, it might hurt you and maybe even kill you. Or you're driving down the highway at high speeds, 100 miles an hour, 120 kilometers an hour, wherever you're living. You're texting and you're searching the internet while you're driving on your cell phone. Uh, you might end up dead or severely injuring someone else. Well, as we consider this, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119 as we continue our sermon series in this particular psalm. Psalm 119, verse 89 to 96. Verse 89. Remember, I mean, pardon me, it's getting late here where I am. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me. For I have sought your precepts, the wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you uh, for your word. Holy Spirit of the living God, just give us uh, understanding and illumination here. We pray these things for your glory, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this first verse, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. The New International Version translates this verse this way. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. We find here as we've read through this particular text that the word of God had been a great source of peace and hope in the psalmist's life as it should be for you and me today. And maybe some of you might remember that last week we were invited to the psalmist's affliction and pain from his accusers. His accusers' lies, it seems, had brought the psalmist to a very low point. The accusers' falsehood, the psalmist describes, almost made an end to him. Verse 87. But as we find here, the word of God, according to the psalmist, is unchanging and sure in all of life's circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And because the word of God is inspired by God, the word of God is a reflection of the nature and character of God who has firmly, according to the text here, fixed the truthfulness of his word in heaven. As one commentator put it, quote, the word is not merely, merely settled in the heart and mind of the psalmist. It has been objectively settled by God in heavens. In other words, my friends, the word of God is not someone's opinion. The word of God has been settled by God himself forever, for the psalmist did say, as we've read and I've already mentioned, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Verse 89. Now Isaiah the prophet, he put it, put it a different way. He said, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. You see, Isaiah, like the psalmist, had put his trust and faith in the enduring word of God, in the same way the apostle Paul describes it to Timothy in his second letter where Paul said, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. And it was because of the enduring and subtle word of God that the psalmist could say here in verse 90, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Do you see that there? The question is, whose faithfulness? Well, the faithfulness of God to all generations. Another psalmist put it this way. The works of his hands, that's God's hands, are faithful and just. All his pre precepts are trustworthy. Psalm 111, verse 7. We also see here God's creative power is mentioned. And just as God's creative power and word established the earth, as Genesis 1 describes for us, and that this creation continues to stand fast, as the ESV puts it, or as the NIV translates the Hebrew, it endures. How does it endure? 
Well, the psalmist tells us in verse 91, by your appointment, by God's appointment, they stand this day for all things are your servant. Here the psalmist viewing God's created order and design and recognizing that all of, God, of creation serves God, serves his purposes and his will. Now I want to pause for a second. There's a lot just said there and take a small inventory, if you will. You see, the psalmist had placed his faith and trust in the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is trustworthy. Because God is trustworthy. Therefore, the word of God can be trusted to guide, to teach, to correct, and train the psalmist in righteousness and holiness, which in turn guided and helped the psalmist in all of his life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, we come upon, in today's uh, message, an excursus. Some of you might know what that is. It is not the same as a rabbit trail. There are some things in this particular text that need to be highlighted. So we're going to spend a few minutes looking at that. For example, we find this text that the faithfulness of God is related to God's truthfulness. And this reminds us of one of the features of Psalm 119 that I already mentioned moments ago, that the Word of God is a reflection of the nature of God. You might remember, we've already seen this uh, when we encountered the goodness of God in, in a few sermons past, that God is good, that his acts or his actions are always good. In our text, what we see here today, we encounter what theologians call the attributes of veracity. The attributes of veracity. Now, let's just keep that simple. What this means, it refers to God's truthfulness. Uh, we appeal today to the Lexham uh, Survey of Theology to help sort through some of this for a few moments here. And it goes something like this. When the Word of God speaks of the truthfulness of God and His Word is pointing to the identity of God. In other words, God is a source of all truth. Wherever there's truth, God is a source of it. Because God is a source of all truth, the Word of God that we, are, we have here with us or you might have in your hands, is true. The Word of God is true because the Word of God is an expression of truth itself. It is an expression of God's very own essence. So the Apostle Paul could say in his letter to Titus, God never lies. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. So that Jesus, as he prayed for his disciples before his arrest, prayed in this way, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth, John 17, 17. And Jesus himself defines eternal life in the very same prayer in this way. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17, 3. And the Apostle John described Jesus Christ, the second person in the Trinity, whom the Father sent as full of grace and truth, John chapter 1, verse 14. And when we apply this to his creation, that is, to people, to you and me, God's veracity, the truthfulness of God, is something that we can participate in as well. And you might ask, how? Well, it's not that complicated. And here it is. When you and I submit ourselves to the word of God, we participate in God's truth. We find an example of this in the Old Testament where the Hebrew prophets were judged to speak truly from God only and only when their message was proven true in relation to the events they foretold. Deuteronomy explains it this way. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. So when we, when you and I, submit ourselves to the Word of God, we participate in God's truth. But when we say, God said this and that, or God spoke to me this morning and said this and that, we are commanded by the Word of God to examine these kinds of statements and see if what they say is in line with God's truth as revealed in His Word. And secondly, any foretelling must come to pass. If not, it's not a word from God. 
So in summation, the truthfulness of God is where the faithfulness of God is grounded. I want to say that again. The truthfulness of God is where the faithfulness of God is grounded. And we see the psalmist highlighting this here, verse 90. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Here the, the psalmist expressing the faithfulness of God to keep all of his promise to all generations. Friends, God's truth is not hidden. There's no like big secret somewhere that we have to uncover. No special knowledge. God's truth is not hidden. It is visible and attainable to all who seek it. And then, of course, last but not least, the truthfulness of God speaks to the divine inspiration of God's word in this unfailing truthfulness. So as we take all that in as much as we can, we consider now verse 92. And it was because of God's veracity and faithfulness that the psalmist proclaimed here in verse 92, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. And this delight of the word of God was not only in the knowing of the word, but in the psalmist's relationship with God. That's so important to understand. And it was in his relationship with God that the word of God uh, and the word of God that the psalmist was able to find strength and endurance in the difficult seasons of life. My friends, indeed, God's, God was trustworthy and faithful to keep his promises as the psalmist pressed into the word of God and said here in verse 93, for by them you have given me life. We might ask what life? Well, someone once said this, quote, the life-giving power and character of God's word. It was this life that strengthened in the season of affliction. So friends, from the sustaining power of the word of God, the psalmist found safety. You know, I found it quite interesting uh, I was thinking about this as I look over the past couple of years, we've heard over and over, or I, I have heard over and over, this particular phrase, be safe, be safe. And I wonder what do people mean when they say be safe? Is this coming from a place of fear or anxiety? Or is this coming from a genuine sense of caring for someone else? You know, one wonders. But one does not have to wonder here in the text. The psalmist wasn't beating around the bush here. Safety for the psalmist was found in his relationship with God. Not that God is safe. The Bible tells us that he isn't, but he is good. He is truthful and faithful and trustworthy. And so the psalmist had put his confidence in the word of God or on the word of God. However you want to say that. And he said here in verse 94, for I have sought your precept. <coughs> precepts. The psalmist had built a solid foundation on the word of God. And it was from this solid foundation the psalmist addressed his enemies here in verse 95. You've got to keep that in mind. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, he said, but I consider your testimonies. No, we go back to verse 83 to 86. That was last week. The psalmist we find there had reached a point of despair because of his enemies' lies and accusations, their falsehoods. But here in our text, despite what verse 95 might uh, sound like to you and me, the psalmist had moved beyond his despair. It's as if he was saying to his enemies, do your worst, bring it on, give it your best shot, because whatever you say or do, I will seek refuge in the word of God. I will seek refuge in the truthfulness and faithfulness of God. I will, I will have the sustaining power of the Word of God providing a solid foundation, a place for, a refuge when needed. The psalmist had that, and he put his trust and faith in the Word of God. As I already mentioned, the Word of God, as Isaiah put, put it, stands forever, Isaiah 40, verse 8. Because the Word of God, my friend, is before creation. The Word of God is sustains creation. The Word of God will remain beyond creation creation. We look at verse 96, we see this phrase exceedingly broad. I just want to mention that NIV translates this boundless. What it is doing here is speaking of the firm foundation of the eternal word of God. Just giving support to what I've been saying all along or what, this, what the text is saying. Well, we transition now from this ancient text here to 
Matthew's Gospel, another ancient text, chapters 5 to 7. Uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, it's often called the Sermon on the Mount. There Jesus was teaching his disciples and anyone else who was around him that what the kingdom of God is like and what it means to live in that kingdom. And as Jesus was bringing his sermon to a close, he highlighted the importance of believing his words and doing his words. Not just believing in his words, but believing his words and doing uh, what he said. <coughs> Pardon me. And then Jesus went on to illustrate, uh, give an illustration, of two builders whose buildings look the same on the outside. Both builders, the wise man and the foolish man, work to achieve the same goal, that is, building a house. And Jesus said, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. Matthew chapter 7, verse 25 and 27. So the power of the rain and the floods in the window, shaking the foundations of these two houses. What happened? Well, the wise man who builds his house on the solid rock, Jesus said, withstood the power of the rain, the floods, and the wind. And the foolish man, however, had built his house on the sand, and the power of the rain, the floods, and the wind brought the house down. Brought it down. So, but here's the point. The psalmist had built the foundation of his life on the eternal, trustworthy, faithful word of God. When trials and tribulations came and shook the foundation of his life, it did not fall. It wasn't easy, but it did not fall. And the one who builds the foundation of their lives, as the Apostle Paul put it in his letter to the Colossians, philosophy and empty, empty deceit, pardon me, empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental principles of the world, and not according to Christ, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. The one who does this, when the trials and tribulations come, come when life just happens, their lives will not only fall, but one, one, one day they will come under the judgment and wrath of a just and holy God if some things don't change. Well, I want to bring this to sort of a close here, um, and hopefully this makes sense to you. I think it will. And I want to ask a question. Have you ever wondered how much, if any, of our 21st century culture has found its way into our thinking and understanding, especially considering our subject today, the Word of God itself. For example, take the philosophy of relativism, which permeates our culture. You know that all truth is relative and there's no such thing as absolute truth. You see, last summer, I, uh, someone who claims to be a pastor once said to me concerning our theological differences, Tony, you do you and I will do me. Crazy, eh? That, my friends, is the philosophy of relativism. You know, the funny thing is that, um, that this philosophy of relativism falls apart with some simple reason and logic are applied. So what the relative is saying then is there is no truth. That's what they're actually saying. There is no truth. In essence, what they're asking of you and me is not to believe them. And then I would suggest we take their advice and not believe them. So it is with this kind of simple reason and logic that we can engage with other worldviews, as such as postmodernism, skepticism, and pluralism, and find each is self-defeating and cannot stand on their own claims. Why? Why can they not stand? My friends, their foundation is built on sand, or, uh, on philosophy, and on the empty a deceit of human tradition which changes at a whim, a whim with a snap of a finger in order to suit the sinful human nature. But our psalmist here is clear when he said, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Amen. Amen to that. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. As we ponder these things, as we look at our culture and our lives, I pray, God, by your Spirit, that you would give us understanding and strength and courage to uh, stand with the truth of God. As we read the Word, as we preach the Word, as we speak of the Word, as we trust you, Lord, in all of our lives, whether it's uh, the good, the bad, or the ugly. We pray all these things, uh, Lord, for your glory. Amen.
Thanks, folks. Have a great day. Shalom.